honored guests here and those tuning in virtually. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to witness the premiere, the world premiere, I might add, of this video release of Das Fliegenpapier, the Fly Paper. I'd like to thank all the members of the 113 Composers Collective who have made this occasion possible. You know who you are. The University of Minnesota School of Music, the American Composers Forum, and all those involved with this new production and realization of the video, including Michael Duffy for his videography and audio wizardry. James Duvall and Justin Spenner for their truly extraordinary interpretation of the music and facial theater. The entire crew that came out to support the preparation of the shooting, um, Joey Crane and uh, Walt Skidmore included, and Vilan Hoven, whose bilingual recitation you hear in the electronic playback and who translated the text that I will read today. And of course, Tiffany Skidmore, who has been my relentless hero <laughs> <laughs> through all the organizational planning of this event and the festival concerts, my deepest gratitude. So to start, I would like to read the Robert Musel short prose piece on which the work is based in English then screen the video, offer a short lecture, then read the German text, and play the video again, as I think it very much deserves a second viewing, after which I would be happy to open the discussion up for Q&A. I might just briefly offer Robert Musel's places and dates, born in Klagenfurt, Austria in 1880, and died in exile in Geneva, Switzerland in 1942. From even those dates alone, you can quickly ascertain the fierce times in which this philosophical writer lived and breathed. So here we go. The Flypaper by Robert Musel Translated from the German by Wieland Hoven. The flypaper tanglefoot is approximately 36 centimeters long and 21 centimeters wide. It is coated with a yellow poisonous glue and comes from Canada. When a fly lands on it, not especially greedily, more out of convention since there are already so many others there. It only sticks to it with the bent outermost joints of all its little legs. A very quiet, uneasy feeling as if we were walking through the dark and our, and our naked souls stepped on something initially, no more than a soft, warm, indefinable resistance yet already something into which gradually the horribly human floods is recognized as a hand that somehow lies there and clings to us with five increasingly distinct fingers. Then with a forced movement, they all stand upright like syphilitic tebetics trying to conceal their affliction or like rickety old army officers and a little bow-legged as if standing on a sharp edge. They brace themselves, gathering their strength and their wits. After a few seconds, their resolve is sharpened and they begin to buzz and lift themselves up as far as they can. They keep up this angry action until Exhaustion forces them to stop. They take a pause for a breath and try again. But the intervals grow longer. 
they stand there, and I feel how perplexed they are. Confusing odors rise from below. Probingly, their tongue pokes out like a little hammer's. Their heads are brown and hairy as if made from coconuts, like anthropomorphic African idols. They bend forwards and backwards on their little legs. Stuck fast, they bend their knees and push themselves upwards, just as humans do when they try in every sort of way to move a heavy load. More tragic than workers, truer than Laokoan in their athletic expression of utmost effort. And then, equally strange each time, comes the moment when the needs of the present second triumph over any longer existential feeling. It is the moment when a climber willingly opens his hands because of the pain in his fingers. When someone lost in the snow lies down like a child. When the hunted man stops because of the burning in his side. They no longer pull themselves away from the surface with all their might. They sink in a little. And at that moment, they are entirely human. They are immediately gripped in a new place, higher up on the leg, or at the back of the body, or the end of a wing. After a little while, once they have overcome their mental exhaustion and resumed the fight for their lives, they are already fixed in an unfavorable position and their movements become unnatural. Then they lie there, propped up on their elbows with their hind legs extended, and try to raise themselves. Or they sit on the ground, reared up with outstretched arms, like women vainly trying to free their hands from a man's fists. Or they lie on their bellies, heads and arms first as if they had fallen while running, and only hold up their faces. But the enemy is always merely passive and only profits from their desperate, confused moments. A nothing, an it, draws them in. So slowly that one can scar scarcely follow it, usually with an abrupt acceleration at the end, when their final inner collapse overwhelms them. Then they suddenly slump down, falling forwards over their legs and onto their faces, or sideways with all legs outstretched. And often on their sides, their legs paddling backwards. As they lie, as there they lie, like crashed aeroplanes with one wing pointing in the air, or like dead horses, or with gestures of infinite desperation, or like sleepers. Even on the next day, one of them sometimes awakens, gropes about with one leg for a while, or buzzes its wings. Sometimes the entire field is stirred by a brief movement. Then they all sink a little deeper into death. Only at the side of the body, around the base of the leg, they have some very small flickering organ that goes on living for a long while. It opens and closes. One cannot make out its features without a magnifying glass. It looks like a tiny human eye, incessantly 
opening and closing. The Flagen Papier. The Flagen Papier of Tangolf is the prox is the fungifer is exundong centimeter light. And so is coat and mail up high. But I'm trying to get open. And ask. When sich a vice at Gedanet, lest, with any particulars on the e gear it, mere as convention. Because so viele andre there orient. Clear it to air sticks far not only sten. Man geborgen wie ab aller ihren Partien fest. Eine ganz weite Phase befand. Es wie wenn wir im Darken with naked souls step on den Sohlen auf, which is only a soft, das noch nichts ist, indeterminate resistor, warmer, jetzt am versichtlicher wie degrees, doch schon human floods, ehrlich das grauenhaft Menschen, which is das erkannt, das fast und die da und Morphys denkt, immer dort. Festhält. Dann stehen sie jetzt auf, die sich nicht mehr wollen, begalt und ein wenig beinig, wenn man auf einen Grad with this force and forces in the stop. As folks for breath art and pause, damn But the about the inner ne. They stand there and I feel we are at a loss there. Von unten in vaping fires up from Münster out. We are in congrope hammer like a small city of a tsunami house. We are cock brown prairie as if hairy shock at aus einer Afrikaner gemacht, anthropophic, and schon ähnlich, ja, Ido. Sie biegen vor, vor, vor und backward auf ihren festgetangenen Beinchen, go down in den Kies and push themselves sich am Bab, the way people do, macht, who are making a wise attempt to run, but, ein sie zu wie ihre Last bewegen. Tragically, dann tragisch, es arbeitet vor und vielleicht wahr, sich ein Ausdruck der äußerst Strengung, es war auch hoch. Dann kommt der Mann mit Peculiar of some Morgan Play, wo dann eine Dörfnis hier die Präsident werden, Prevail und Stuff, the powerful drives with his Dose to endure, Stars siegt. Es ist in der Augen Weimar, wo er die Relaxe auf Wege des Hands, auf den Hand mit dem Pain, nicht in Griff der. When someone lost in the snow lies down like a child, der ein Kind, who hops with a soft hand in a bend and fight. They pull on the Sing them, let's all in. And then, make them. So far, and see, and still a good fat. Da oben, in. A hint, hip. And the eye, bugles. Overcome the mental ex. And our short, our resume. The life. They fixed in a terrible pit. Their movement become a. mit gestreckt Women vainly trying And it draws them in. Don't come end. Mit den Beinen rück.
Sometimes, even on the next day, one will wake up and grope for a while with a leg or buzz with a wing. When I was a child, we lived in Los Angeles with a relatively large backyard and above the yard, a hill's incline extended upward and was not landscaped like our neighbors, but wild and teeming with insects in the tall grasses, their eggs, their larvae, their pupae their adult forms crawling about and in the air above, fluttering or zipping here and there. As a child, I thought, I would like to become an entomologist. But since that didn't happen, we might blame Johann Sebastian Bach for that, insects discovered another way to continue in my life and found an access hole into the music. In even the most perfunctory of surveys, one notices that my work is generally pointillistic. Hmm. Bugs are a bit like points, a bit like dots, aren't they? And insect movement itself can be quite jointed. One might also attribute this predilection for staccatissimo, to the instruments themselves that I play, the plucked string of the Japanese koto and the hammered string of the pianoforte. In fact, it took me quite some time to find a way to sustain the notes, eventually through the metaphor of the lungs and the bow and time stretching. But it was, with electronics, this dotted world of sound and its high resolution might continue unconstrained and translated into granular sampling, as if I wanted to treat all audio sources with a cotoplectrum, an ivory pick. And notice I say not granular synthesis, but granular sampling. I suppose one might say, metaphorically speaking, I prefer a chunky peanut butter over a smooth one. And why is this? The chunks are 
just noticeably identifiable, J and I, to their source recordings, which for me is important, that the world of compositional material retain its reference to an identifiable physical acoustic reality. This is the lens through which that world is perceived. And as my dear friend Rick Burkhart observed, it is as if that were through the compound eyes of an insect like those of the fly, with their hundred faceted oculi perceiving the world through a composite of fragments. And so insects, insects return. But the fly, the fly is the enemy of the people, as you know. Pest control in the time of horses as a means of power and transportation in cities invents what Robert Musel calls the poisonous fumes of the fly paper. But the poisonous fumes eventually turn into gas canisters that will kill humans first on the battlefield and then in gas chambers, the industrial extermination of people. We are the fly, or what you do to the fly, you will do to yourselves, you humans. And that is the magnifying glass as mirror through which we observe. That is the implied metaphor of this piece. Surely, Musel knew about gas warfare, but not yet of gas chambers. Despite this, it is his nearly scientific observational perspective. His first career was an engineer, let us not forget, implicated with a sadistic voyeurism disguised as objectivity that is so striking and prophetic in Musel's reflection on this one object of examination. Ruminating on an object of such striking metaphorical power and implications. When the fly becomes human, how this metaphor will evolve into quite the real horrors of the near future he might have conjectured at one point. One day someone asked me in a lecture, I'm sorry, I forget who, asked me, so why is the flypaper in English and German? It's a good question, if not basic. Sometimes the simplest questions are the most challenging to answer as one doesn't yet have an adequate or thoughtful response. It would take time. You finish a piece, you think you know what it means. No. Especially that which hopes to conceal itself from you. And sometimes the answers take decades to reveal themselves, and sometimes only with the help of friends. Well, the truth is, another one of my long-term obsessions, I'm not only thinking of flies, thank you, is translation, and particularly the translation of literary texts and poetry. And the structure of this manifests itself beautifully in the bilingual volume of a collection of writing a book, let us say, German on the left side of the page and English on the right, in the case of these volumes that I often consult. This verso recto page and English on the right, I'm sorry, this verso hinge structure, hmm, a bit like a bivalve clamshell, a concealing structure 
informs many of my duos, but really larger ensembles work, larger ensemble works as well. Each musician, for instance, might have a doppelganger, as musical variation is transcription, or I like to think metaphorically as translation. One important tool that I use in most of my work is spectral analysis, and that then describes, uh, transcribes an audio file into musical notation. Uh, just briefly, spectral analysis employs the Fourier transform, which can be thought of as what a prism does to white light, decomposing it into its constituent frequency bands or colors, but here with sound into its constituent harmonics as sine waves. Filtering algorithms then whittle down a mass of these harmonics into MIDI data that can be turned into music notation that is well nearly playable, though always interpretable. The conceptual assumption is that there are always two, left and right, James and Justin, different but similar. And if observation, watching, becomes quasi-analytical, even on a subliminal level, or explicit, were we allowed to stop and start rewind and fast forward the video at will, as one does when studying the editing, we might begin to question if there are not two flutes, but at times only one. If the hands are not those of both musicians and not just the hand of one, or even if the video has not been presented twice in certain passages, but in reverse. And with Michael Duffy's mind-boggling treatment and extraordinary filming and editing, every correct sameness is constructed. Every error is absolutely intentional. Every discrepancy between left and right allowed to remain is there to ensnare the expectations of the viewer so the viewer's perception, determinations, and certainty about perceived events are themselves caught on their own metaphor metaphorical and perceptual flypaper. Our thwarted predictions are assumptions become the stuck flies wiggling in brief moments of uncertainty. But let us return to that bilingual book, the German on the left, the English on the right, that eternal dichotomy as the persistence of variation, then linguistic and or musical. Close the book and the two languages, well, finally, they can come together. They press together. They become one. But paradoxically, we no longer have access to the works, to the words. We no longer can read. The book is closed to us. What are the two languages doing in that time and space when the book is closed? Ah, just open the book and there you have them side by side. The German on the left, the English on the right. Or do you? In this work, the two languages appear torn apart, ripped, shredded, tattered, fragmented, jumbled, braided, 
a violence has occurred. One language interjects on the other and vice versa, but not in any real coherent way. Only occasionally can one make out a phrase, possibly a sentence. Time passes and slowly on the next day, the next month, the next year, the next decade, one perhaps realizes a reason for this. It is inherent in the structure of the bilingual volume, a hinge structure, as I said, the revelation that this book's pages, Das Fliegenpapier, the fly paper, are strange. They have been made not with normal printing paper, but with glue paper, fly paper. And on closing the book, the pages have stuck themselves together that on opening the volume, the words of the two languages have been torn apart in tattered and scattered jumbles, jumble of the shards, and splinters of the two languages. And this insight is not my own, however much I would like to claim it, but my friend, Jeff Halstead, who is an artist and architect and clearly understands the strange material consequences of architectural processes. You know, for instance, the effect of sunlight on a building in accordance with its light reflective or absorptive surface materials and properties. And it is not my interpretation, as it is not my interpretation, I can enjoy it as one that can be, be, be perceived from the outside, from outside my head. There's a sense that the question that has given me such concern over the years can be responded to objectively. Well, at least not personally. It's good to have friends. Das Fliegenpapier, the flypaper, is both about a metaphorical blinking eye returning the gaze towards the scientific observing I, you, the audience as spectator, through the magnifying glass that has transmutated into a mirror. The mirror is the agent of translation and here it shows us that what you do to the fly, you will do to yourself. It is just a conceptual transcription just a simple mirrored image. And that's why this piece is in both German and English to answer the inquirer's puzzling question. It is in two languages as the metaphor of flypaper that is poisonous gas and its diverse uses has rotated itself seemingly on its axis to become translation. Horizontal things conceal themselves brilliantly when they are turned vertical. That is a great lesson from Webern. Obvious melodic symmetry horizontality, rotates to become hidden harmonic symmetry, verticality. So we frame the piece, start and end, with that choreographed gesture of the flute rotating on its axis. Resting position becomes playing position. Playing position becomes resting position. A simplest of gestures. Theater, if you like to call it, that comes from no other arena of choreography 
and music itself. Thus, anything that seems like an obvious discrepancy in James and Justin's doubled performance, for instance, if one musician is looking at the audience and the other is not, or if the speed of a page turn is ever so slightly different, is only a setup, a trap, a decoy in preparation for an echoed reflection when the two faces finally merge as one. In fact, Justin had his hair cut to allow this climactic possibility its striking effectiveness. The composite face in Duffy's meticulous handling is uncanny and offers us a glimpse, an image however brief, of the oneness of the two languages when the bilingual book is closed and unreadable. It's shocking, or better said, when was the last time you saw a face composed of two distinct individuals walking down the street? Unreadable. As the piece is only about seven minutes long, I would like to play it again. Preface this time by the reading of the German text. And here I beg for your patience, especially from those that don't understand the German. You've heard the English and as German and English have so many cognates and other similarities, both structural and sonic. There is the possibility of understanding on some level, perhaps on many levels, more than one might think at first. But the point is, in doing this, is to bring to bear the idea of the experience of translation for itself, a shifting focus on sense, then sound, and now sound, than sense. So here we go. Das Fliegenpapier von Robert Musel. Das Fliegenpapier Tanglefoot ist ungefähr 36 cm lang und 21 cm breit. Es ist mit einem gelben, vergifteten Leim bestrichen und kommt aus Kanada. Wenn sich eine Fliege darauf niederlässt, nicht besonders gierig, mehr als Konvention, weil schon so viele andere da sind, klebt sie zuerst nur mit den äußersten, ungebogenen Gliedern alle ihre Beinchen fest. Eine ganz leise, befremdliche Empfindung, wie wenn wir im Dunkel gingen und mit nackten Sohlen auf etwas treten, das noch nichts ist als ein weicher, warmer, unübersichtlicher Widerstand und schon etwas, in das allmählich das grauenhaft Menschliche hineinflutet, das erkannt werden als eine Hand, die da irgendwie liegt und uns mit fünf immer deutlicher werdenden Fingern festhält. Dann stehen sie alle forciert aufrecht, wie Tabiker, die sich nichts anmerken lassen wollen, oder wie klapprige alte Militärs und ein wenig hohbeinig, wie wenn man auf einem scharfen Grat steht. Sie geben sich Haltung und sammeln Kraft, und Überlegung. Nach wenigen Sekunden sind sie entschlossen und beginnen, was sie vermögen, zu schwirren und sich abzuheben. Sie führen diese wütenden Handlungen so lange durch, bis die Erschöpfung sie zum Einhalten zwingt. Es folgt eine Atempause und ein neuer Versuch. 
aber die Intervalle werden immer länger. Sie stehen da und ich fühle, wie ratlos sie sind. Von unten steigen verwirrende Dünste auf. Wie ein kleiner Hammer tastet ihre Zunge heraus. Ihr Kopf ist braun und haarig, wie aus einer Kokonuss gemacht, wie menschlich ähnliche Nägeidole. Sie biegen sich vor und zurück auf ihren festgeschlungenen Beinchen, beugen sich in den Knien und stemmen sich empor, wie Menschen es machen, die auf eine Weise versuchen, eine zu schwere Last zu bewegen. Tragische als Arbeiter es tun, wahre im sportlichen Ausdruck der äußersten Anstrengung als Laukorn. Und dann kommt der immer gleich seltsame Augenblick, wo das Bedürfnis einer gegenwärtigen Sekunde über alle mächtigen Dauergefühle des Daseins siegt. Es ist der Augenblick, wo ein Kletterer wegen des Schmerzes in den Fingern freiwillig den Griff der Hand öffnet, wo ein Verirrte im Schnee sich hinlegt wie ein Kind wo ein Verfolgter mit brennenden Flanken stehen bleibt. Sie halten sich nicht mehr mit aller Kraft ab und unten. Sie sinken ein wenig ein und sind in diesem Augenblick ganz menschlich. Sofort werden sie an einer neuen Stelle gefasst, Höhe oben am Bein oder hinten am Leib oder am Ende eines Flügels. Wenn sie diese seelische Erschöpfung überwunden haben und noch eine kleinen Weile den Kampf um ihr Leben wieder aufnehmen, sind sie bereits in einer ungünstigen Lage fixiert und ihre Bewegungen werden unnatürlich. Dann liegen sie mit gestreckten Hinterbeinen auf den Ellbogen gestemmt und suchen sich zu heben. Oder sie sitzen auf der Erde, aufgebäumt mit ausgestreckten Armen, wie Frauen, die vergeblich ihre Hände aus den Fäusten eines Mannes winden wollen. Oder sie, oder sie liegen auf dem Bauch, mit Kopf und Armen voraus, wie in Blauch gefallen und halten nur noch das Gesicht hoch. Immer aber ist der Feind bloß passiv und gewinnt bloß von ihren verzweifelten, verwirrten Augenblicken. Ein Nichts, ein Es zieht sie hinein. So langsam, dass man dem kaum zu folgen vermag, meist mit einer jähen Beschleunigung am Ende, wenn der eher letzte innere Zusammenbruch über sie kommt. Sie lassen sich dann plötzlich fallen, nach vorne aufs Gesicht, über die Beine weg oder seitlich, alle Beine von sich gestreckt. Oft auf auf die Seite mit den Beinen rückwärts rudernd. So liegen sie da, wie gestürzte Aeroplane, die mit einem Flügel in die Luft ragen oder wie krepierte Pferde, oder mit unendlichen Gebärden der Verzweiflung, oder wie Schläfer. Noch am nächsten Tag wacht manchmal einer auf, tastet eine Weile mit deinem Bein oder schwirrt mit dem Flügel. Manchmal geht solch eine Bewegung über das ganze Feld, dann sinken sie alle noch ein wenig tiefer in ihren Tod. Und nur an der Seite des Leibs, in der Gegend des Beinansatzes, haben sie irgendein klein, ein ganz kleines, flimmerndes Organ. Das lebt noch lange. Es geht auf und zu. 
Man kann es ohne Vergrößerungsglas nicht bezeichnen. Es sieht wie ein winziges Menschenaugen aus, das sich unaufhörlich öffnet und schließt. The Flagen Papier. The Flagen Papier of Tangolf is the prox is the fungifer in such some tongue sent me the light. And so his coat and me yellow pride. And I'm to gelten. And ask. When sich a vice at your damn it, lest, with any particulars on the eight years, mere as convention. Because so viele andre there oldent. Clear it to air sticks far not only spin. Man geborgen blieb ab aller ihren Pappchen fest, little. eine ganz weit Phase befand. Es wie wenn wir im Darken with naked souls step on den Sohlen auf, which is only a soft, das noch nichts ist, indeterminate resistor, warmer, jetzt am versichtlicher wie degrees, doch schon human floods, ehrlich das grauenhaft Menschen, which is das erkannt, das fast und die da und Morpheus denkt, immer dort festhält. Dann stehen sie jetzt auf, die sich nicht mehr wollen, begalt und ein wenig beinig, wenn man auf einen Grad with this source of the forces in the stop. As folks for breath art and pause, damn But the... But the inner... Ne. They stand there, and I feel like we're at a loss there. From under the vapor, we rise up from the under out. Like a can grow tum, like a small city of a tongue. Your cock brown powdery as if hairy shock hat. Aus einer Afrikaner gemacht, anthropophic, and schon ähnlich, ja, Ido. Sie biegen vor, vor, vor und backward auf ihren festgetangenen Beinchen, go down in den Kies and push themselves sich up, the way people do, mach, who are make a weise attempt to run, but, ein Sitz zu weh, relast bewegen. Tragically, then, tragisch, es arbeitet vor, und sein wahrschlichen Ausdruck der äußerst Streckung, es war Oko. Und dann kommt der Mann mit der Tür auf seinem Nogen weg. Oder an den Dörfen ist hier die Präsident der Präferung. Die Powerful Drives, wie sie sind aus dem Tür, ist da siegt. Es ist in der Augen Reimer, wo er die Relaxe auf Wege für das Hand. Finger an, wo die Pein nicht in den Griff der. When someone lost in the snow lies down like a child. Wie ein Kind, die Wups wird das Subtrain mit dem Bändenden verstrengt. Der Pill und doch. Sofort und sie in Stelle gefasst. Da oben ein Hinterhalb. Ende ein Hügels. Overcome the mental and a short or resume the life. They fixed in a terrible pit. Their movement become a Die mit gestreckt. Women vainly trying. And it draws them in. Und am Ende.
mit den Beinen rück. Sometimes, even on the next day, one will wake up and grope for a while with a leg or buzz with a wing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to my lecture and watching. Uh, I think we'll open it up for the Q&A now. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is uh, about granular sampling. Mm. Um, do you find a particular enjoyment in collecting your your samples in the same way that, say, you put together, you might enjoy putting together an insect collection? And how do you go about creating and collecting your granular samples? Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly a, an insect collection, I'd say. The, well, my father was a scientist and before, I mean, immunologist, but before he got his PhD, he taught high school but, and he had all these beautiful jars of preserved creatures floating in formaldehyde. I think you've seen those in museums. And uh, he kept some in the garage and I was really frightened to go into the garage. <laughs> I mean, not only was it dark in there, but there were these things in jars and, and um, it, dawned on me that, yeah, this became, I mean, I was a child when, when I experienced that. And then he, 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 uh, he, he did research at UCLA, and UCLA has an amazing collection of these specimens. And at open house, one was allowed to go in and see the menagerie of, of preserved, not only um, animals and insects and, and various things, but also, you know, like fetuses, human fetuses and things like that. So a real, a real uh, menagerie of all sorts of metaphors that uh, I thought became clearly the, the uh, a, a kind of metaphor or image for the notion of an archive or a collection or a database. Uh, it's the idea of, uh, of samples, you know, audio samples as in relationship to this is, is kind of interesting because if you think of it, um, 
we have this idea of live music and live music, but we don't call the other thing recorded music. Uh, we don't call it dead music, but I like to think of it as preserved music. So preserved in some kind of uh, uh, notion of a container or a jar that's just a, a sound file, right? But uh, it's interesting that the idea of a sound file also has the notion that you can have a medium uh, when we, you know, before digital recording, there was a lot of hiss, noise and sound, hiss, hiss of the room, hiss of lights buzzing. And before denoising, before we could do that, you'd have uh, these, uh, a sample that was uh, kind of suspended in, in, uh, in a medium. And you could hear that medium, just like you can kind of see the formaldehyde, uh, even though it's transparent. Uh, but you know, you know it's in there. So that whole that whole jar metaphor and the preserved, uh, and then the collection kind of obsessive collecting, obsessive compulsive collecting, uh, is a pleasure <laughs> and a torture. <laughs> the, the the idea of torture and pleasure probably coming together in that. Uh, so the idea of collecting, like. Yeah, you see people who collect insects and pin them on those on those uh, boxes. Uh, it's 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 almost like uh, well, it's no longer the creature. Obviously, it's not the fluttering butterfly, right? It's the scientific kind of objectified notion. So I am playing with this notion, this idea of uh, bringing in that kind of objectivity and playing it against the the human subjectivity that obviously Muzel is also doing. Um, yeah, so the pleasure of collection and uh, yeah, the, the idea of then going and making a piece out of this collection, so that's a really good point. Why not just collect? Some people just take the pleasure in collecting and, and, uh, and that's it. That would be fine, but uh, I think the notion of collecting is still in the piece, so maybe you can hear the pleasure of that, it, especially if you listen to many pieces of mine in one after the, the other, that there's a, a notion that uh, I'm taking great pleasure in, in individual, tens of thousands of individual sound samples uh, that create a mosaic for a piece. So. Uh, yeah, so the, the next task, though, after the collecting, or maybe during, or at the same time, in many instances, is to put it all together to synthesize all that, which is now kind of before you. And uh, that's the metaphor. Metaphor, you know, I don't have a pre-compositional map that I use. It, I Instead, I have a... a, a like a grand metaphor that will bring it, that I can always refer to. And when I'm feeling like I don't know what to do, I always consult the metaphor, just as someone might consult a pre-compositional map. And it's got to be a strong metaphor. And that's how I work moment to moment, to moment putting together and stitching together these samples until yeah, the, the material speaks to me. And so does the, the compositing that I'm doing and tells me how to proceed from there. And that's, that's just as pleasurable. So uh, there's, uh, and torturous. <laughs> um, yeah, it takes me a really long time to, to write a piece. So but thank you for, the, did I answer the question or? Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, about how you're thinking of the more theatrical elements. Mm. Um, and uh, I haven't completely formulated this question, but uh, how are you thinking about musical versus theatrical elements? Or is, there, is that an unnecessary distinction between the two? There's a, one, one of the moments I'm thinking of is when the, uh, 
whole of the flute is opening and closing. Yeah. Um, there's it suggests a very musical. It's a very musical gesture, um, but you know it doesn't exactly make a sound, but it sort of suggests a sound. Um, so like, is there a particular distinction you're thinking of when uh, working this way and in potentially other pieces? Because I know a lot of your music uses, uh -huh. has these theatrical elements. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that's a really good question. And someone asked me, I think it was Perry So, the conductor of Diary of a Lung, that will be coming up uh, in the festival. Uh, what's the difference between some of these pieces like sideshows, really explicit theater? I mean, you're just making, they're making faces and grins and all that. I think that's really maybe another category. I, I, I even call that music theater, but maybe I shouldn't. But uh, in any case, uh, with the piece called Diary of a Lung, it's much more of a symphonietta, much more on the side of music than explicit theater. I think I would call that something different, like uh, uh, a category of mu uh, music with subtle theater, or something like that. So, uh, and uh, and this piece is, I think it's in that category, subtle theater. So, so even though um, you might not know the other category of more explicit theater, I can tell you a little bit about my approach to the, the idea of theater. Ideally, I wouldn't like there to be a dichotomy. Um, ideally, conceptually, and again, I might be lying, <laughs> so be careful, uh, that conceptually, I would like the idea, you know, uh, that the theater that I do comes from music, it, that it doesn't come from the other fields, okay? from theater, and I, I don't have a problem with the other fields, it's just maybe I've spent a life in music, and so I feel allied to musicians, and I feel that a lot of the things that I do actually are just, just they're just gestures and choreography that come from music, but are pushed a little bit further into the realm where you might say conceptually it's 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 gone a little bit too far and we see it and we categorize it as theater uh, but let me just uh, show you how maybe i can justify it from music um, i think of theater as orchestration uh, orchestration think of doubling oh yeah, doubling happens a lot. So when you double, like, uh, you know, maybe you have a melody in the clarinets and you double it in the oboes or, or the octave above in the flutes, for example, it's to, it's to give it more body, maybe, it, you know, to emphasize it, to give it a richer timbre, a more complex timbre, but you're reinforcing it. All I'm doing with the theater is taking, say, a musical gesture, maybe one that should be played, but I ask them to lip sync it, and I push that to, into the visual realm. So I'm reinforcing that thing. You know, it, it is just maybe just for example, the flute being turned from resting position into playing position and just doing it so slowly and doing it in a coordinated manner just makes you look at it from the start. But it's a really simple gesture, but it has been pushed forward because it's coordinated casually Two flutists would just pick up the flute, you know, independently of each other. But because of that coordination, that orchestration, it's orchestrated, that it's been emphasized and reinforced. And for me, yeah, that doubling is like I've orchestrated that gesture. And so it's been pushed out into the visual realm where it used to kind of be in the background. Uh, they have to get up there to playing position, but they don't have to coordinate. Now, there are a lot of things like that that are pushed into the visual realm that started from music. And so, uh, you know, t -t 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 doing those things. Now, the lifting up of the thing, no sound, but now the camera zooms in, look at it instead. Look at what you actually can't, never looked at, never saw before. Uh, when the live, the live version will come, 
Bob, there is that just that moment. It's hard to see, very hard to see because uh, you're, you might be far away from the audience. So, but with a video, the advantage, the great advantage is that you have close up. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying is my, a, a kind of claim and allegiance to the fact that, or the idea that my theater comes from music and not from theater. Uh, um, you know, you, you don't have to be an actor. You shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't be an actor. You know, why, Steve, why don't you bring actors in and have them do that? No, I'm allied to musicians. I want musicians. It's a musical existential notion that it's musicians that are doing these things. Now, that might sound constrained and limited and probably is, but uh, it's a whole world of possibilities. So I'd like to work in that, in that realm and, uh, and see what's possible. Uh, you know, you can only do so much, I think. But uh, remember, percussionists, and I'll be working on a trio for percussionists. Percussionists are those, you know, the pianist is allowed to look this way. Uh, but a percussion, you know, because that's the way the piano, grand piano is on stage, right? Uh, looking this way. So most musicians are looking straight at the audience. Pianist gets to look this way. That's very unusual for a musician not to be addressing the audience. But a percussionist is always reaching. I might have to actually walk over here. So they're really special creatures in some ways. They, they move across the stage. So if, if you just emphasize that, mute theater from music, you can have them walk across the stage, but they're not actors yet, or maybe they won't be, they're musicians. That's my claim, I suppose. Uh, so you might say, oh, look, look at all the theater in, in my work, but maybe it's just music that's being orchestrated. <laughs> we have a question on the webinar from Sumanth Gopinath. He says, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and your piece. I'm interested in the colonial dimensions of the source text. Musil racializes and aestheticizes the fly as an African idol and how it resonates with the problem of two-ness of language in the piece that you discussed and your own lived experience as non-white, as existing within and between a variety of cultural contexts. Among other things, I thought of the mashup of the two texts as akin to Denglish, which one encounters frequently in the German-speaking world today. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great observation. Well, clearly, um, yes, the, uh, the other pest control, insects, flies, pests generally, and the, the idea of using this on human beings, the, what is it, the, I think the, the term was the scum of the earth, right? To eradicate the scum of the earth using pest control. So, uh, yeah, so definitely this, this is brought up in the eradication or the extermination of people through the gas chambers. Um, yeah, so, so Musel is obviously uh, someone who lived uh, through the First World War and almost, almost lived through to the Second World War. Uh, so experienced those things as they were, uh, the, the idea of applying these, uh, this note, this, this idea, this hor horrendous idea of, of how to view and, and treat human beings uh, in his time at the time of understanding the what was going on in Europe, with uh, particularly with anti-Semitism. So yeah, so in the text, he does compare the the fly with uh, brown and hairy coconut, and uh, as African idols, right? So uh, that reference to obviously people of color, people who are non-white. Uh, obviously, I'm. I'm very interested and and involved in this understanding, and uh, ironically, uh, 
I think that he his works was his work was also I mean as a as a white person his work was was banned and he died in poverty and exile in Switzerland and uh, so was also a victim so but to bring it in the context of who I am now uh, working in our time with the understanding of uh, of my 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 non-white artist BIPOC uh, perspective on the world uh, using this text, uh, which is German and English, uh, is is something that is uh, for me a, an important uh, investigation into my relationship to what I understand as my aesthetic, uh, my aesthetic roots in new music. Uh, I, I, as I said, I perform Japanese music and I'm very much involved with Asian aesthetics, particularly with Japanese aesthetics. I think that you might understand that you can see this explicitly in a language of German and English but the, so much of the posturing and gestures and the atmosphere comes from the Japanese theater, the, say the no theater, for example, or the ritualistic uh, stylization of the Japanese tea ceremony. So that brings in all that as well, perhaps not in Japanese, but in a Japanese kind of language of, uh, of performance mode and, and kind of stoicism in that sense. So it's, it's not only the German and the English and the history particularly that, that, that um, moment in history that I'm referring to. I am bringing myself and my perspective and my interpretation of where I am with new music, with the Austrian German tradition as it is brought to the United States and disseminated through my education and my understanding and also through my the lens of being uh, an Asian American composer so it's all there uh, how you read it how I interpret it it's all very much there and I hope that it's uh, not that hidden uh, but that it can be read and interpreted in the way that you would like to interpret it. Uh, from the composure to the violence in it and the disturbing, discomforting feeling of, of the situation that, uh, that I'm presenting, which is, uh, I think in general, all my music is, tends to put the, the kind of discomforting, put on this discomforting lens on, on what one is observing and spectating. Even, even the notion of spectat spectatorship uh, is hopefully brought into critical uh, question. And I think that's uh, kind of my stance or manifesto, if you will, in dealing with uh, all of these very important identity references. Thank you all for being here. I'm so sorry about the delays at the beginning of the event. Um, we are headed off to rehearsals for the festival. And uh, I hope that you'll join us at uh, some of those events on the, the 8th, 9th, and 10th and see much more of Stephen's work. Thank you.